Mr. Bessel was the senior partner in the firm of Bessel, Hart and Brown of St. Paul's Churchyard. He was an unmarried man and he occupied rooms in the Albany near Piccadilly. For many years, he was well known among those interested in psychical research as a liberal-minded and conscientious investigator. In November 1896, he commenced a series of experiments in conjunction with Mr. Vincey of Staple Inn to test the alleged possibility of projecting an apparition of oneself by force of will through space. Their experiments were conducted in the following manner. At a pre-arranged hour, Mr. Bessel shut himself in one of his rooms in the Albany and Mr. Vincey in his sitting room in the Staple Inn. And each then fixed his mind as resolutely as possible on the other. Mr. Bessel had acquired the art of self-hypnotism and he attempted first to hypnotise himself and then to project himself across the intervening space of nearly two miles into Mr. Vincey's apartment. On several evenings, this was tried without any satisfactory result. But on the fifth or sixth occasion, Mr. Vincey did actually see, or imagine he saw, an apparition of Mr. Bessel standing in his room. He states that the appearance, although brief, was very vivid and real. He noticed that Mr. Bessel's face was white and his expression anxious, and moreover that his hair was disordered. It seemed to Mr. Vincey as though the figure glanced over its shoulder, then vanished. Mr. Vincey made a note of the exact time, then at once took a cab to the Albany to inform Mr. Bessel of this result. He was surprised to find Mr. Bessel's outer door standing open and the inner apartments lit. An empty champagne magnum lay smashed upon the floor, a table had been overturned, and one of the delicate chintz curtains had been violently torn from its rings and thrust upon the fire, so that the smell of its smouldering filled the room. When summoned, the porter came at once to see the state of affairs. This settles it, he said. Mr. Bessel's gone off, he's mad. He then proceeded to tell Mr. Vincey, that about half an hour previously, at about the time of Mr. Bessel's apparition in Mr. Vincey's rooms, the missing gentleman had rushed out of the gates of the Albany into Vigo Street, hatless and with disordered hair, and had vanished in the direction of Bond Street. And as he went past me, said the porter, he laughed, a sort of gasping laugh, and waved his hand, with all his fingers crooked and clawing like that. And he said one word, life. Mr. Bessel did not come back that night, and at last Mr. Vincey returned in a very perplexed frame of mind to his own premises in Staple Inn and went to bed. For a considerable time he could not sleep, and when at length he did attain an uneasy slumber, it was at once disturbed by a very vivid and distressing dream. He saw Mr. Bessel gesticulating wildly, with his face white and contorted. He even believed that he heard the voice of his fellow experimenter calling distressfully to him. Mr. Vincey awoke with such a strong conviction that Mr. Bessel was in overwhelming distress and in need of help, that he arose, dressed, and set out through the deserted streets towards Vigo Street to inquire if Mr. Bessel had returned. But he never got there. Some unaccountable impulse turning him aside towards Covent Garden. There he became aware of shouting, and perceived a figure running swiftly towards him. He knew at once that it was Mr. Bessel. He was hatless and dishevelled, and he grasped a bone-handled walking cane. He gave no sign of recognition. Instead, he cut at his friend savagely with a stick. Mr. Vincey, stunned and astonished, fell heavily on the pavement. With the assistance of several passers-by, Mr. Vincey struggled to his feet, and a multitude of voices competed to tell him of the behaviour of the madman as they regarded Mr. Bessel. He had suddenly appeared in the middle of the market, screaming, Life! Life! striking right and left with the blood-stained walking stick, and then fled laughing. Mr. Vincey's first impulse was naturally to join in the pursuit of his friend, but then came the news that Mr. Bessel had eluded his pursuers. The next morning, Mr. Vincey rose late, unrested and anxious. 
and went down to St Paul's churchyard to Mr Hart, Mr Bessel's partner. He was surprised to learn that Mr Hart had also been disturbed by a vision, the very vision that Mr Vincey had seen, Mr Bessel, white and dishevelled, pleading earnestly for help. The two gentlemen decided to inquire at Scotland Yard for news of their missing friend. He's bound to be laid by the heels, said Mr Hart. He can't go on at that pace for long. But the police authorities had not laid Mr Bessel by the heels. He had run amuck through London, eluding with amazing agility every effort to stop or capture him. Then he had vanished. But all that day there was a persuasion in the back of Mr Vincey's mind that Mr Bessel sought his attention. And all through the night Mr Bessel, with a tear-stained face of anguish, pursued him through his dreams. And whenever he saw Mr Bessel in his dreams, he also saw a number of other faces, vague but malignant, that seemed to be pursuing Mr Bessel. It was on the following day, Sunday, that Mr Vincey recalled certain remarkable stories of Mrs Bullock, the medium, and determined to consult her. She was staying at the house of a Dr Wilson Paget, and Mr Vincey repaired there forthwith with the intention of invoking her help. Scarcely had he mentioned the name of Bessel when Dr Paget interrupted him. Last night, the doctor said, we had a communication. He left the room and returned with a slate on which were certain words written in the handwriting of Mr Bessel. Dr Paget proceeded to explain. It appears that in her seances Mrs Bullock passes into a condition of trance. During it, one or both of her hands may become active and will then write messages. It was one of these that Mr Vincey now had before him. It consisted of seven words. George Bessel, Excav, Baker Street, Help, Starvation. Indeed, Mr Bessel was found at the bottom of an abandoned shaft near Baker Street Station. His arm and leg and two ribs were broken. But his madness had passed from him altogether. At the sight of his rescuers, he gave way to hysterical weeping. He was taken to the house of a Dr Hatton, and on the second day he volunteered a statement. He explained that though his first attempted self-projections in his experiments with Mr Vincey were unsuccessful, through all of them he was concentrating all his power and will upon getting out of the body. At last came success. At one moment... I was seated in my chair, and then I perceived myself outside my body, saw my body near me, but certainly not containing me. At first, Mr Bessel's thought chiefly concerned itself with where he might be. By a strenuous effort of will, he had passed out of his body into a world beyond this world, a world undreamt of yet lying so close to it and so strangely situated with regard to it that all things on this earth are clearly visible from there. For a time he was unable to shift himself from his attachment to his earthly carcass, and then quite suddenly the link that had bound him snapped, and he found he was driving along like a huge cloud, and he was surrounded by faces, such faces like those that glare upon the sleeper in the evil hours of his dreams. But never a word they said, never a sound from mouths that seemed to gibber. Idiot phantoms they seemed, children of vain desire, beings unborn and forbidden the boon of being, whose only expressions and gestures told of the envy and craving for life that was their one link with existence. And it came to Mr Bessel that evil had happened to his body. So strong was this persuasion that he thought no more of Mr Vincey but turned about forthwith. But he returned too late. In an instant he saw the body that he had left inert and collapsed, lying indeed like the body of a man just dead. He saw that body had arisen by virtue of some strength and will beyond his own. 
He watched it fling his cherished furniture about in the mad delight of existence, smash bottles, leap and smite in a passionate acceptance of living. He watched these actions in paralysed astonishment. Then he hurried to Vinci to tell him of the outrage that had come upon him. But the brain of Vinci was now closed against apparitions, and the disembodied Mr. Bessel pursued him in vain as Vinci hurried out into Hoban to call a cab. Foiled and terror-stricken, Mr. Bessel swept back again to find his desecrated body hooping in a glorious frenzy down the Burlington Arcade. For the being whose frantic rush through London had inflicted injury and disaster had indeed Mr. Bessel's body, but it was not Mr. Bessel. It was an evil spirit out of that strange world beyond existence into which Mr. Bessel had so rashly ventured. For twenty hours it held possession of him, and for all those twenty hours the dispossessed spirit body of Mr. Bessel was going to and fro seeking help in vain. At last he chanced upon a brightly lit room, and four or five quiet gentlemen and a woman, a stoutish woman, dressed in black bombazine. He knew her from her portraits to be Mrs. Bullock, the medium. She kept on talking and writing with one hand and Mr. Bessel saw that the crowding shadows of men about him were all striving and thrusting to touch regions of her brain that glowed and stirred. As one gained her brain, or another was thrust away, her voice and the writing of her hand changed, so that what she said was disorderly and confused, now a fragment of one soul's message and now a fragment of another's. Meanwhile, Mr. Bessel went away to find what had happened to his body and found it at the bottom of the shaft in Baker Street, where the evil spirit lay writhing and cursing and weeping and groaning. Then Mr. Bessel returned with redoubled earnestness to the room where the séance was going on, and struggled so stoutly with his will against the others that presently he gained the woman's brain, and in that instant she wrote the message that Dr. Paget preserved. Finally he went back and watched for long hours at the bottom of the shaft. And towards dawn, the thing that he had waited for happened. The brain glowed brightly, and the evil spirit came out, and Mr. Bessel re-entered the body he had feared he should never enter again. He lay there for the space of about three hours before he was found, when in spite of the pain and suffering, in spite of the tears, his heart was full of gladness to know that he was nevertheless back once more in the kindly world of men. David McAllister reading The Stolen Body by H.G. Wells. It was abridged by Madge Hart and produced by Pat McLaughlin. And we'll hear the final H.G. Wells ghost story in the series after the weekend. It's called The Door in the Wall. The Comedy Club on BBC Radio 4 Extra. With me, Jessica foster And now it's time for my favourite bit, where I get to talk to someone and I'm lucky enough to be being joined by the formidable Jordan Brooks. Hello. Hello, thank you for calling me formidable. It, it sounds like a compliment, but do you know in French, I think, they say just formidable. Formidable. I think it just means all right. Oh, really? Yeah. Just fi- acceptable, <laughs> just fine. No, no, I often, if I'm feeling a bit vulnerable, I'll often say to my girlfriend, I'm feeling very vulnerable. Because I, I, I think it makes it sound way more grand and like, you yeah, know. Yeah, it does actually. Yeah. And anything... It's sexier, isn't it? Add an arble to anything, and it's uh, <laughs> infinitely more attractive. Actually, I want you to do a show called Add an Arble. <laughs>